In today's video, with the help of the cadavers here in the lab, we're going to be discussing the procedure known as the tracheostomy and see exactly what's going on as that airway is being restored. It's going to be a refreshing one. Let's do this. Let's first start with the anatomy in the area, that way we can best understand exactly what's happening during the procedure. The larynx, or what most would refer to as the voice box, is the beginning of the respiratory tract, or at least the point with which it fully separates from the digestive tract. Now it's made up of several cartilages, muscle tissue, epithelial tissue, and connective tissues. But the largest of the cartilages is what's known as the thyroid cartilage. And it's typically even larger in males due to testosterone fueling its growth. Just below it is the cricoid cartilage, which is shorter in the front than it is in the back. Now both the cricoid and thyroid cartilages are made of what's known as hyaline cartilage. Now hyaline cartilage functions to reduce friction as well as hold its shape. However, there is another visible cartilage in the larynx called the epiglottis, and this is going to be made of elastic cartilage tissue. Now, the epiglottis functions to block the airway when swallowing from food and drink, because that would obviously be bad. In fact, we did an entire video about when it doesn't work properly, so you should definitely go check that out. If we look past the epiglottis and directly into the larynx itself, you'll see a small gap with soft tissue to the sides. These are the vocal folds, which are involved in controlling pitch during speaking and singing. So like, ha, 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 ha. I know, that was beautiful, but there's no need to applaud, so please take a seat. <laughs> but thyroid actually translates to shield, and that's exactly what it's doing. It's a thick piece of cartilage that is there and designed to shield the vocal folds from any potential damage. Between the thyroid and cricoid cartilages is a connective tissue called the cricothyroid membrane, or also sometimes called the cricothyroid ligament. Now, it acts to limit the movement between the thyroid and cricoid cartilages, and Knowing its location is essential to performing a proper tracheostomy. The trachea, or what's most often called the windpipe, is formed by C-shaped rings called tracheal rings, although the rings don't go all the way around. But just as in the larynx, these rings are made of hyaline cartilage, which allows it to retain its shape while also always staying open so that you can constantly breathe in and out. Between the rings, we find connective tissue segments called annular ligaments, which are there to keep those cartilaginous rings in place while also allowing for movement to occur. On the posterior side of the trachea, you're going to find muscle tissue, which is going to assist in coughing, so it's like <coughs> <coughs> but it's also going to help to provide just overall integrity to the trachea itself. The trachea will then split into what's known as the primary bronchi, and then from there it's just gonna continue splitting and splitting as it goes deeper into the lung tissue. We then have the thyroid gland, which is just below the larynx, but it doesn't belong to the respiratory system. Instead, it's a part of the endocrine system and is responsible for things such as metabolism and bone density. Still though, it's an important landmark to identify simply because you don't wanna damage it during the procedure. Okay, so now that we have an understanding of what we're looking at, Let's go ahead and discuss exactly what's happening during a tracheostomy. Do you know what the fastest growing crime in America is? For years, this crimes rate has been surging, affecting millions of Americans. I'm talking about identity theft, and there's a new victim every 14 seconds. Yet, despite this, for those who've had their identity stolen, they're often left shocked when it happens. Imagine trying to log into your email account one day, only to find that the password had changed hours ago. You soon start getting notifications of activity from your bank, credit cards, and crypto accounts. It's at this point, the feelings of panic, fear, anxiety, disbelief, guilt, all of them start setting in. That's why we're excited to partner with Aura, the sponsor of today's video. Aura is identity theft protection, fraud monitoring, a VPN, password management, and antivirus software, all combined into one easy to use app. Aura monitors the dark web for your emails, passwords, and social security numbers and sends alerts fast right to your phone and email. When it comes to fraud, every second matters. Connect credit and bank accounts and get notified of changes up to four times faster than Aura's competitors. Their VPN allows you to stay anonymous online by keeping your browsing history and personal information safe and encrypted. Their antivirus software blocks malware and viruses before they can infect your devices. For me personally, Aura has already discovered my personal information 
on the dark web three different times. So when you sign up for the free trial, be sure to let us know how many times Aura has found your personal information. Protect you and your family from America's fastest growing crime. Try Aura free for two weeks and see if yours and your family's personal information has been compromised. Start your free trial at aura.com slash IHA. All right, let's get back to it. Most people are aware of something called a tracheotomy. However, definitions, equipment, procedures change over time. And these days, most refer to a tracheotomy as the incision being made in the neck. And then a tracheostomy is when you add tubing to that hole in the neck. However, depending on who you're talking to, they may use the, ter the terms interchangeably, which personally, I don't really have a big problem with. There can be several different reasons why someone would require a tracheostomy, but it's probably easiest if you just think of it as being either emergent or elective. Emergent tracheostomies are seen as the last resort and are typically caused by a full obstruction of the airway itself. And that could be caused by say food, although that's a whole lot less common than people think it is, or facial trauma, as in maybe you experienced some horrible accident. This is where you'll usually see something called a cricothyroidotomy, which is where they make an incision in the cricothyroid membrane and then insert tracheostomy tubing in order to restore the airway. Although there is another pathway that we're about to discuss that you also could take under emergent conditions. Elective tracheostomies are performed under general anesthesia and are usually a result of respiratory failure from things such as neurological problems. So maybe you had brain or spinal cord trauma or maybe lung issues like pneumonia, but it also could be many other things that just require prolonged mechanical ventilation. To make things simple, let's assume that someone is undergoing an elective tracheostomy. The surgical team is going to need to identify a few landmarks to ensure that they're cutting into the correct location. So first, they're going to identify what's called the thyroid notch, which is at the top center of the thyroid cartilage. From there, they're going to locate the jugular notch, which is the groove at the top of the sternum. Then they're going to go just a couple of centimeters below the thyroid notch and locate the cricothyroid membrane as well as the cricoid cartilage. This is where they'll make an incision, cutting either horizontally or vertically and making their way through the skin layers until they see an extremely thin muscle called the platysma. Now, they'll then cut through the platysma, exposing two strap-like muscles of the throat called the sternohyoid and sternothyroid. These muscles, as well as many others, are going to be involved in speaking and swallowing. They'll then pull the muscles laterally to expose the cricoid cartilage and thyroid gland. Although, the thyroid gland isn't always visible, meaning they just sometimes don't have to do anything with it. But other times, they need to ensure that they're not going to damage it during the procedure. So they will tie or clamp off what's known as the thyroid isthmus, which is going to connect the left and right aspects of the thyroid gland. From there, they'll place a hook underneath the cricoid cartilage and lift it towards the head, pulling both the larynx and the trachea into view. From there, they'll identify the second and third tracheal rings and an incision will be made. Now here's where different techniques can be used. Maybe they just cut into the annular ligament between the tracheal rings or maybe they cut into the tracheal rings themselves and actually remove the segment outright. Or they could just cut it enough that they can bend it over and create this cartilaginous flap that could be placed back and stitched together at a later point. But regardless of the technique used, from here, this is where they insert the tracheostomy tubing, essentially completing the procedure. Several different complications can arise from performing tracheostomy, although the most common is going to be bleeding. Bodies are unique and additional blood vessels can grow that you don't anticipate and normal blood vessels can take a different pathway than you anticipate, making it all the more likely that a surgeon could potentially cut them during the procedure. However, surgeons are very much aware of this and this is typically not an issue. The bigger problem with bleeding is that most patients that require a tracheostomy are critically ill, meaning that they may have a coagulation problem. and that can be a pretty serious problem considering even if the surgery is going very well, the patient can continually bleed, which is why many patients will require a platelet transfusion prior to the surgery to ensure proper clotting. But other complications could be an infection or maybe pneumothorax, which is where air gets trapped between the lungs and the rib cage, although those are extraordinarily rare. When it comes to removing the tracheostomy tubing, they'll ensure the patient can breathe on their own by capping off the tubing 
and then observing the patient over time to see how oxygen and carbon dioxide levels are handling it. If all goes well, they will then remove the tubing, stitch the patient up, and they are now on their way towards recovery. It's unfortunate that I even need to say this, but chances are pretty good that you've seen a movie or a television show where someone performs an emergency tracheostomy with something like a pen. This is a really bad idea and is far more likely to cause harm than it is do, to do real good. Again, just think to the variability within the human species. Blood vessels may not be where you think they are. I was once teaching a class of EMTs and they informed me that EMTs aren't allowed to perform emergency tracheostomies anymore. And that's because some EMTs, when attempting to perform the tracheostomy, were missing the cricothyroid membrane, or maybe they were hitting blood vessels that they weren't intending to, or in some cases, they even went too far into the trachea and were damaging the posterior wall of the trachea. Again, causing extreme damage, and in some cases, even killing the patients they were attempting to save. So, unless it's the apocalypse, or you've exhausted pretty much every option you have, please avoid using a pen at all costs. Thanks again to Aura for sponsoring today's video. Be sure to click the link in the description below and start protecting your personal information today. As always, be sure to like, comment, subscribe if you feel so inclined, and I'll see you in the next video.